Okay, welcome to our Streamflow and Habitat Assessment class. I'm Eric Adman with Snooking Watershed Council. And what we're gonna go over this evening is Streamflow monitoring. We're gonna talk about the concepts involved, why we do it, what are some of the methods that are used, and then what are the steps that we go through to complete that. Then we'll cover essentially the same topic with regard to habitat assessment. So we're gonna talk about concepts, the purpose, methods, and steps involved in completing that. So first of all, just to put these types of monitoring in context, uh, we monitor a number of different things and there's multiple factors that can affect the health of a stream. There's a concept called the uh, five factors of biotic integrity which these are factors that are involved in the health of a stream. So one is water quality, and these are some of the variables that we monitor on our regular monthly monitoring. Also, what are the inputs like energy sources in terms of leaf litter that are sort of the beginning of some of the food chain or some uh, human inputs like fertilizer? Uh, is the food chain complete or not? So what's happening in that uh, system? You know, so for instance, if something's happening due to high stream flows or pollution that wipes out some of the macroinvertebrates that could remove part of the food chain so that could affect the, the, the health and the integrity of the creek. What's happening with regard to flow? So um, some examples of what can impact the flow regime would be stormwater and urbanization can affect how uh, frequently and how rapidly water flows through a creek. And also what sort of habitat is present in the creek. So a uh, natural creek in a rural area has lots of different types of habitat, but sometimes those get modified in an urban area, urban environment, and remove some of those habitat structures. So that also can make it so that uh, the creek is not quite as uh, healthy. Other important factors in terms of the health of a stream, land use and urbanization can affect all those uh, factors listed above. And another factor is shade, which affects stream temperature. So we monitor a number of these different things and we're gonna learn about a couple of ones that we haven't really delved into that much uh, this evening. And just to reference um, this concept, five factors of biotic integrity was from uh, uh, Dr. James Carr, who was uh, with the University of Washington. And this is referenced in the Streamkeepers Field Guide, which by the way, is an excellent reference. This is my personal well-thumbed copy. And so I would encourage any of you to visit the Northwest Stream Center, pick up a copy of this guide and uh, use it to expand your knowledge as a stream keeper. So we're gonna talk about some concepts involving stream flow monitoring. So essentially stream flow or discharge is the volume of water that moves over a designated point uh, over a certain period of time. And we, when we're talking about stream flow, we usually measure it in cubic feet per second. And the amount that's flowing in the stream is essentially related to what's flowing off the watershed and into the stream channel. There's a number of factors that can affect the flow. So one is weather and storms. So for instance, a storm in an urban area is gonna create a lot of storm water. Seasonally, obviously we get a lot more rain in the winter here than we do in the summertime. Where you are, so if you're in an urban environment versus a rural environment and what's happening in that environment can affect the flow. So for instance, in an urban environment, water tends to run off more quickly and into the stream and through the stream more quickly, where in more of a rural or natural environment, um, it might run off more slowly, recharging the, the groundwater and then the level of the stream would drop more slowly. Uh, other factors that can affect the stream flow are water withdrawals like wells. 
In terms of what flow does within the stream, uh, it kind of depends on how much there is and how fast it's going. The effects that it will have are, it can affect water quality. So for instance, if you have high runoff and you have unstable banks, you could have turbidity like what's shown in the picture here. Um, and that can also affect um, the habitat for what lives in the stream. Another consideration is that, for instance, larger, faster rivers and streams would be less impacted by a particular pollutant discharge if it was a small one than, say, a smaller, slower one. It also determines the types of organisms that can live in a creek. So some things need to prefer to live in more of a fast flowing area, and some things prefer to live in slower flowing areas. Another thing that flow will affect is silt and sediment. So what you'll, you'll notice that typically in like a riffle or a rapidly flowing area, you don't find a lot of silt on the bottom. But when you hit a slower portion of the creek, that's where the silt that that water has been carrying gets deposited down. Another effect of flow is that it affects the dissolved oxygen um, just by the physical process of uh, moving and tumbling. So there's some different ways that you can measure and calculate stream flow. So one example is a fixed gauge. So this might be somewhere where you want to have like a continuous data logger, or you want to be able to remotely monitor what the level is at a certain point. And so for this type of a gauge, you'd go through a process of calibrating this gauge so that you know that when the gauge reads a certain amount, that represents a certain amount of cubic feet per second. You can also get some handheld instruments that you can use to instantaneously read flow. But again, you still have to do some measurements to calibrate what that exactly means in terms of cubic feet per second in the creek. And then there's uh, techniques like what we use which are basically kind of uh, fairly simple and uh, don't require a lot of expensive equipment. So the method that we are gonna talk about and use is essentially use a float, a measuring tape and a waterproof uh, yardstick so you can measure depth. And with that, we'll calculate a, what we call the cross-sectional area at a couple of different points, and we're gonna measure the time it takes for the float to travel between an upstream and a downstream point. And this is the equation that we're gonna use. So uh, this will be on our worksheet and you'll get a little bit familiar with this equation, but essentially we're gonna come up with an average cross-sectional area of the stream. So we're gonna take an area downstream and an area upstream and average those. We're gonna multiply that by the length of the stream reach that we're measuring. And then we're gonna at, multiply a coefficient or a correction factor, which essentially um, corrects for the fact that in different types of environments, like a rocky bottom versus a, a smooth bottom or a muddy bottom, the flow on the top travels faster than the flow near the bottom. So it's a factor to account for that. And then you have to divide it by time so you can get uh, your measurement cubic feet per second. So before you head out, first thing you want to do is uh, keep your safety factors and considerations in mind. So, you know, for instance, if you were measuring North Creek, where we're going to be tomorrow, you might want not want to go there on a period where there's been a big storm and you've got high flow. Some of the equipment that you might want to bring, depending on your method, uh, would be um, some string, some stakes, and a hammer. And you're going to use that to establish a transect across the creek. A tape measure, so you can measure how far the creek is across and also uh, measure the, the distance between your upstream and downstream points something that you can use to measure how deep the creek is. So that's an example of Belinda with Pierce Conservation District holding the flow sticks that they use. 
And so um, I've made a couple of flow sticks that we'll be using for our class tomorrow. You need something to mark intervals on your transect string so that uh, you know where to take your measurements. So um, you can either estimate where those are if you're like on a very small stream, or if you have a wider stream, you might wanna actually mark off the intervals so that you're more precise about where you're taking your measurements. And you need something that's gonna float downstream that you can time between points. So we often people use an orange because of the, the buoyancy of it. It kind of sinks down, um, kind of neutrally buoyant and then something to catch the orange. Something to do your timing with and then optionally a calculator. So then you can identify where you're gonna select, where you're gonna do your, your flow monitoring. So you wanna generally select either a straight riffle or a run. Uh, you wanna to try to avoid going around a bend because that may, depending on whether your object that you're floating gets into the outside or the inside of the curve, that might affect the speed. Ideally, you want some water that's at least six inches deep. So if you have a water body that has a stretch that's at least that deep, that's what you'll use. You want to pick one that's got a relatively consistent flow throughout, so you're avoiding a slow section or a pool. Uh, you'll use the equipment, as I described, to lay out your transects perpendicular to the stream. And again, typically the upstream and downstream uh, distance that we set apart is about 20 feet. So we've set up our transect. Next step that we're going to do is calculate the cross-sectional area. So in that formula, it's the letter A, and it's the stream width multiplied by the average depth. So the way to do that is we're going to first of all measure the, the length of the transect. So that's the stream width. And then we're going to divide it into equal sections. So some methods use four equal sections, like in this diagram here. Uh, the method that we're borrowing from Pierce Conservation District uses eight sections. You can also use more than eight sections. So in whatever method you use, you're gonna take a series of measurements and then average those. So you'll measure the depth at each of these points and you'll record that on your form so that you have your series of measurements that you're gonna average. You'll average those. And the one thing that might be a little bit confusing here would be like in this example, you're taking essentially three measurements because on the, the bank where you have your <clears throat> transect sitting, the measure the distance is zero. So you're measuring in this example, you're measuring at points B, C, and D, and you're dividing by four to account for the fact that one of your measurements is the, the depth at the bank. So then you're gonna come up with, you've got your uh, average depth that you've calculated and you multiply that times width. That will give you your average cross-sectional area. And you're gonna add that together with your, so if you did your downstream, you're gonna add that together with your upstream cross-sectional area and then divide by two to get your average cross-sectional area for the reach of the stream where you are doing your, uh, your measurement. The next thing to do is you're gonna measure the travel time. And so what you're gonna do is use a stopwatch and you're gonna time how long it takes for the object to float from the upstream to the downstream transect. As I mentioned, the orange is a good object to use because it floats just below the water surface. So it's not really susceptible to wind, like say if you were to use a lightweight object like a ping pong ball. Um, another reason for this is that this is a good thing to use is because they're biodegradable. So if you accidentally lose it, you're not uh, littering something that's gonna stick around forever. You wanna put it into the fastest portion of the current, which is typically in the middle. And so you'll start your time when you release it at that upstream transect, and then the clock stops when it passes fully underneath your downstream transect. 
you want to do this measurement at least three times and then average your result to get essentially what is the, the typical time. And again, you could do more than three times if you want, but you want to do at least three. So now you've gathered your different variables and you can plug them into this equation once again. And once you have that equation, you'll come up with a number four cubic feet per, per second. So I'll give you an example. So here's an example. Let's say that your average cross-sectional area was some number, say 5.42 for the purposes of this illustration, and you had a 20 foot distance between your transects. You're on a rocky bottom, so you use the rocky bottom coefficient, and it took 15 seconds travel time. So your A, your average cross-sectional area, 5.42, L is your length, C is your coefficient, T is your time. So you plug those into your equation and you come up with 5.78 cubic feet per second. You'll record that on your data sheet. So you're gonna record all your different measurements and ultimately your, um, your calculation and then you're done. So pretty straightforward, really. Um, and, but we'll get a chance to practice it in the field tomorrow. So I'm just going to um, stop sharing for a second and just see if anybody has any questions right now. Any questions on that so far? I have a question. Sure. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I monitor Perrinville Creek in Edmonds and at two different spots, neither of which is six inches, or at least not in the months that I've seen it. Mm -hmm. um, should we find a spot that that is just to start getting consistent data for that body of water? No, I think, you know, that it's ideal if you're monitoring a creek that's large enough that it has sections that are six inches, but I don't think it's absolutely essential. So like, for instance, in the, the videos that Pierce Conservation uh, District Stream Team shares, they're monitoring in a much smaller creek and, it, and it's fine. So it's just, if you had a choice in a creek between a section that was deeper in a section or at least that deep in the section that wasn't, it would be, it would be better to do it in the, the deeper section. But if you don't have one, then use what you have. Okay. And um, I'm consistent about doing chemical and bacteria monitoring in the same spot. Um, should the, if we do 20 foot span, should, should that spot for chemical monitoring be one of the ends of the 20 foot span? You see what I mean? I think if I were you, I would just pick, you know, I would try to be in the vicinity of that okay. site, but you, you know, you could fudge it up or down depending on what made the most sense for your site and was the easiest to set it up that way. Cool, thank you. Sure, yeah, I think you'll wanna look at the flow and uh, there are some stream reaches where the flow is pretty variable from one side of the stream to another. And that's kind of a hard place to get a meaningful measurement. So if you can find an area where the flow is pretty consistent all the way across, that would be a better choice than trying to force it to be where you happen to do your chemical monitoring. Gotcha, thank you. I, hey, I have a general physics question. So maybe this is like totally not accurate but wouldn't the weight of the object being floated downstream affect the rate like you're saying like the ping pong ball is going to flow way faster so i'm just wondering why that's not included in the equation i think that's why you try to pick an object that has a sort of a neutral buoyancy so it sits like just below the surface um where like you know if you did use a lighter object like a ping pong ball that might that might not you know it might be affected by other factors like wind Mm -hmm. okay, uh, cool. And the drag on the object will get it moving at the same speed as the water pretty quickly. So you may want to drop it in a little bit upstream of where you start so that it can accelerate to the water speed. And, you know, as Eric pointed out, if it's light and sticks up in the air, then it's going to have wind forces moving it one way at one speed and 
water force is moving at in another direction at another speed and you know, your results won't be as accurate. Great, I, li I like the physics um, education on all this. Cool, thanks. Okay, great. Um, I'm gonna move into the next section where we're gonna talk about habitat monitoring. Okay, so habitat assessment. There's a number of different ways that you can conduct habitat assessment. And the one that we're using is adopted by Pierce Conservation Stream Team for their volunteer assessments. And since they're a fairly large, well-established volunteer monitoring program in our region, uh, I thought they would be a good model for us to adopt in our methods. Uh, the method that they use in term is based on a protocol, which is known as Streamwalk, which was developed by the EPA in Seattle for volunteers to use for monitoring habitat. So we're going to cover the method that uh, Pierce Conservation District uses, the assessments that they go through, and the data sheet that they use. In addition, we're going to talk about some methods that King County uses along with their annual BIBI sampling to quantify uh, tree canopy shading and also characterize the, the substrate into uh, what sort of predominant substrate is there. And these are methods that you could either use in conjunction with the Pierce Conservation District uh, habitat assessment process, or you could, they're optional. You don't have to use them. We're gonna typically use these when we're doing the, um, benthic index of biotic integrity, uh, macro and bitter invertebrate sampling. So typically habitat assessment is performed in late summer and early fall, but you could determine the frequency for your own purposes and do it more often if you want more information. So if you wanna see, for instance, what is the variability at different times of year, uh, that might be useful to you in a certain situation, but what we're recommending is do it at least once a year. You also want to look more than just at your exact site because the area around your site affects that site. And so you're going to include an area 100 feet upstream and 100 feet downstream. And again, you can determine the size. That's the, the method that is recommended in the Pierce Conservation District, uh, or that's the, the area which is recommended in their method. Um, the Stream Keepers Field Guide actually uses 250 feet upstream and downstream and 250 feet to each side, so a 500 by 500 area. So depending on the technique or how much information you want to gather, you can really pick an area. And the key would just be pick a certain size area and be consistent with it over time so that your, your observation is useful for tracking changes. So before you start, you want to figure out when you're going to do it where you're going to do it and define exactly how big of a site you're going to use. Don't forget your safety considerations. So, you know, what's the weather like? Is it a stormy situation? Is your site safe and ideally have a partner? You want to gather up the things that you're going to need to uh, do this assessment. So those would include a thermometer, measuring tape, a specific piece of equipment called a densiometer if you're gonna be using that, which is part of the King County method and a pebble gauge. And we'll talk about these different pieces of equipment. The other thing is you wanna figure out, am I gonna be looking at a, a muddy bottom site or a rocky bottom site? Um, do I wanna use the King County habitat form and bring that so you can document what you find? So first we're gonna talk about habitat assessment using Pierce Conservation District Guide in their forms. So the first thing that's looked at on the PCD form is what's called general characteristics. And so a lot of this has to do with the, the way that the water looks. So 
it can be clear, which is typically what we find in a creek around here under normal flow situations. Uh, sometimes you might see some foam, which in some cases can be caused by pollutants, but in some cases it can be natural in origin. You might see an example of turbidity, like what we see in the image there. Um, so different things can indicate what's going on with the creek. And you might say, so note what it looks like is one of the first general characteristics, whether it's rocky or muddy bottom. Another thing to note would be, do you smell anything? So hopefully you don't necessarily smell anything, but if you do smell something, you wanna note that as well. Other general characteristics that you're always going to monitor, water temperature, the width of the channel, which you can either measure it or you can estimate it if you have a good sense of how wide it is and it's not super wide. And what kind of land use is in the area. So there's a section on the data sheet for these variables. And so you can just make some check marks and some notes and record this on the data sheet. Uh, there's a section on the data sheet for other observations and notes, and this is where you're going to sketch your site. So if you've never done it before, and it's bigger than that um, when you have the actual piece of paper, um, if you've never done it before, this might be a place where you want to sketch your site. Um, if you've been monitoring a given site for year after year, then you might want to just update your site. So this is an example of a fairly detailed site sketch that shows you know kind of what path it takes what sorts of buildings are in the area what kind of vegetation is around it um, where's the inside and the outside of the curve uh, you know probably this a good thing to indicate on your site here would also be the start and the end of the reach that you're assessing so this is one of the sections on the data sheet that you'd want to fill out So we're gonna first go through the rocky bottom assessments. So there's two different data sheet uh, assessment forms. One is for rocky bottom streams and one is for muddy bottom. So first we're gonna talk about the one for rocky bottoms. So the first assessment that you're looking at is what's called attachment sites for macroinvertebrates. So this is essentially what sort of uh, space and substrates are available for the things to attach to. The more of these that you have, the more the variety of insects that you're gonna find. In your ideal situation, you're gonna have mostly cobble and less boulders and gravel if you're measuring a stream. Now it depends on if you're doing this assessment on a river, then you might have more boulders, but generally like a smallish stream around here, you'd like to find cobble. And this is the, uh, the section of the data sheet for marking your scoring. So I don't know if you had a chance to watch the video of, uh, from Pierce Conservation District of them going through this, but essentially, um, you're going to take a look at the stream and you're going to look at the characteristics here. So does it have a riffle and a run? What's the relationship between the riffle and the stream width? How long is it? What sort of substrate is there? And then you're going to essentially pick a number that you feel characterizes the site the best. Next thing you're gonna look at is what's called embeddedness. And so that's essentially like how much are the rocks uh, either covered by or surrounded by or sunken into silt, sand, or mud. So if you have a high degree of embeddedness, then there's less little void spaces for things to live and take shelter in it and for uh, uh, spawning and egg incubation by fish. And so you're gonna, to estimate this, you're gonna observe the amount of silt or fine sediments that are on the rocks 
And one way you can do that is to pick the rock out and kind of see, like if you take a rock out, how much of that rock that you pulled from the bottom is covered by sediment. So again, this is gonna be kind of an estimate based on how much of the space is surrounded by sediment. Next characteristic we look at is specifically shelter for fish. So this is looking at uh, structures that would provide fish habitat. So those include fallen trees, logs, branches, large rocks, and uh, undercut banks. Next characteristic that we're gonna evaluate is sediment deposition. So typically what's gonna happen is if there's sediment being carried down the stream, when it hits a slower section, it's gonna get deposited. So in some cases that's in a pool or an inside bend, some cases it's in the middle of the stream. If you have a lot of sediment that's getting deposited, it's not necessarily the best environment for a lot of organisms that live in the stream or in the bottom of the stream. And they'll create different structures that you can see when you look at the stream. One way that you can tell if they're new or not is to look at is anything growing on them. So typically ones that are new don't have anything growing on them yet. And this is our section for evaluating sediment. So up in the, uh, I didn't um, list out what these different categories are, but uh, essentially the, as we go across from uh, left to right, the, the left one is optimal. The next category over is called suboptimal, then marginal, and then poor. So um, I've just, copied out sections of the data sheet for each of these sections that we're going through see if, so we can go through them one by one. But that's, that's what each of those different divided sections represents. So the next characteristic we're gonna look at is uh, a combination of stream velocity and depth. And you really wanna have a variety of stream velocities and depth combinations. So, um, in some cases, it's useful to have deep and um, deep and slow sections because they each serve different purposes. So fast water benefits the dissolved oxygen, keeps pools from being filled up, brings things into the, the food chain. Slow water provides some shelter areas. Shallow water running through a riffle could be more easily aerated but then again, it can warm up more quickly. So each of these different areas has its benefits. So you're really looking for how many of these types of combinations do you have? Next category is channel alteration. So we're looking for what kind of large scale things have been done to the stream channel. So for example, would be, it's been placed into a concrete channel or it's had some sort of artificial embankment built on it or bank stabilization. It's been straightened. There's dams or bridges or culverts or um, pipes flowing into it. Uh, it's very uniform because it's been dredged. So those type of environments that have been more altered are uh, less beneficial for fish and other things that live in the streams. So generally, uh, the less alteration, the better. So we'll look at the, uh, the different the amounts that we have here. And so essentially, if we have minimal alteration, then we're going to be in the optimal area. If we have maybe a little bit of some alteration, but nothing recent, then we might be suboptimal. 
if it's obvious there is a lot of alteration on both banks, then maybe we're kind of marginal or if you're completely altered, then that's in the poor category. So we'll pick one of those numbers and add that on our data sheet. Then we're gonna look at the channel flow. So essentially how much of the channel is filled with water. So this is gonna change, you know, as flow changes. And when the channel uh, isn't covering much of the stream bed, then it doesn't provide as much habitat. So this is another variable that we'll take a look at. Next thing is what kind of vegetation is on the banks that's natural. So the benefit of this is that it reduces erosion and also provides kind of hiding places and habitat for fish and macrovertebrates and also a food source by dropping leaves. So the ideal situation is we got 90% of the stream bank is covered. Uh, less ideal is 70 to 90% is covered by vegetation, but maybe uh, it's been disrupted or part of it is invasive plants. Uh, marginal would be 50 to 70% is covered, but you see bare soil. Um, maybe there's mowing or something that's right up to the edge of the stream. And then your poor situation would be left less than 50% coverage. The vegetation has been disrupted. It's been removed. Uh, so case in point would be the stream that we live on, Little Swamp Creek, when we first moved in, had mowed lawn right up to the bank of the creek. So that would have been in the poor category at that time. The next question is, or next variable that we look at, what is the condition of the banks? So what is the likelihood that they're going to be eroded and how eroded are they? So steep banks are more likely to suffer from erosion than gently sloping banks. Things that you can look for to indicate that there's erosion is the bank is crumbling, falling apart. It's not vegetated. You see tree roots sticking out. You see exposed soil. So again, we're going to go through this and kind of look at does it look stable, moderately stable? Um, does it look like there's evidence of erosion or does it have lots of evidence of erosion? The next thing, kind of the final factor of the, the 10 factors that we're looking at for the rocky bottom is the riparian zone width. So the riparian zone is the area of vegetation around the stream that affects the stream. And we're gonna measure that from the edge of the stream bank out and estimate how wide is it. That zone has some benefits to the creek. So one of the things that is it does, it prevents pollutants from entering it. Um, it also controls erosion and provides habitat. So for our assessment purposes, we're gonna call it optimal if the width of the riparian zone is greater than 50 feet. But in reality, a, an optimal riparian zone would be more like two or 300 feet. Um, but for our assessment purposes, we're gonna call it optimal if we're greater than 50 feet. So our optimal is greater than 50, uh, suboptimal is 30 to 35 to 40, marginal is 20 to 35, and poor would be less than 20. So then once we've gone through and made these assessments, we're gonna come up with a score, kind of an index. So we're gonna add up all the scores and then divide by two, because there's 10 categories which have up to 20 points each. Um, and one of the things I didn't mention is that on uh, one, some of the earlier categories that we were looking at, such as um, bank vegetative protection and condition of the banks um, and the riparian zone, we're gonna come up with a score for the left bank and for the right bank separately. 
So we add up all our scores, which the maximum value would be 200 divided by two to get our habitat index score. And then we're gonna compare that to our index. So if we're greater than 90, we're excellent and so on through the different categories. So that is the scoring, the assessment and scoring process for the Rocky Bottom with the using the Pierce Conservation District method. So they have a separate assessment, which is similar for Muddy Bottom. It's mostly about the same, but there are some differences. So whereas the Rocky Bottom has attachment sites for macroinvertebrates, uh, the Muddy Bottom has shelter for fish and attachment sites for macroinvertebrates. Uh, the rocky bottom looked at embeddedness. The muddy bottom looks at the pool substrate characterization. Uh, pool variability is not something that was looked at in the rocky bottom assessment, so that's looked at as well. And then the channel sinuosity is looked at as well. Quick question, Eric. Yeah. Um, so if I'm looking at the entire reach of stream that I'm assessing and I'm at about 50% is a silt bottom and 50% of a rocky bottom, at what point is the transition from calling it a, a muddy bottom or a, um, a rocky bottom? That's a good question. Um, uh, I'm not sure really, to be honest with you, I think we'd have the pools are all silted up where the water is slow, mm -hmm. nothing but rocks where the water is faster. Hmm. Well, in that case, you know, I suppose you could use, uh, go through both processes to a degree and then kind of somehow average or combine your result. Average them. <laughs> well, we'll have to think about that. That's a good question. Maybe yeah, that's a good question for me to run by the conservation district because I'm, you know, that's just my best guess as to how to proceed on that. But I don't actually have that. Yeah, if you if you have to get asked, that'd be great. Sure. Good question. Okay, so we'll take a look at these different individual categories that are in the muddy bottom that are different than the rocky bottom. So one is shelter for fish and attachment sites for macroinvertebrates. So this is uh, basically what kind of space is available for the things that live there. And the more that you have of these and the more different types of these that you have, then the more different types of fish and, and insects you're likely to find. There's a couple of terms here. One is, um, you're looking at the things that fall in the water. So if it's something that's just fallen in the water and it hasn't been broken down much yet, you call that new fall. Things that have been in the stream for some time are gonna go through some changes. So for instance, leaves are gonna turn color. They might get a little bit slimy. They might get softer. Woody debris is gonna darken. It's gonna become smoother, fall apart a little bit, maybe get slimy. So when you find that type of debris that's been in there for some time, you could, that's referred to as old fall. And so we're gonna use that as we look at our detailed criteria here. So first of all, you're looking at, okay, how many different types of environments are we finding? So if we find snags, logs, undercut banks, rubble, stable habitat, and it's mostly old, that's optimal. We find some of that and some that's old, but uh, mostly new, then that's suboptimal. If we only find a little bit of that environment, it looks unstable and uh, there's only a little bit of new stuff and really no old, then that's marginal. And if there's very little of those types of habitat and really nothing in it in terms of new or old leaves or wood, then that's poor. So that's the first one that we're going to look at for our muddy sites. The next 
unique characteristic we're going to look at is pool substrate. So we're essentially looking at what is the bottom like in the pool. So pools that are more stable um, and have a bottom that's like gravel or sand and plants are generally better than ones that have mostly just mud or just strictly rock and no plants. So this is our, our matrix that we look at for the pools. So on the poor end, you could find pools have hard pan clay or bedrock. Um, an example of that would be there's places on Swamp Creek where due to high stormwater flows, you look at the edge of the banks and you can see hard pan on the banks. So if you had a pool with hard pan, that, that means you have an area that's basically getting scoured out regularly. So that's that would be an example of a poor pool substrate. Also looking at pool variability. So like what sorts of pools are you finding? So you can either have a large shallow one, a large deep one, a small shallow one, or a small deep one. And the more of these different ones you have, the better. So we're gonna look at the mix of types of pools that we have as well and um, come up with a score. And the final variable that is unique among uh, for the muddy bottom versus the rocky bottom is called channel sinuosity. So essentially that means like how much does the stream channel bend or meander? Generally ones that meander provide a more a greater variety of habitats and velocities. And so that helps dissipate some storm energy as well as it provides just more habitat options. Uh, straight segments are typically pretty even. And I think the section that we're gonna be looking at tomorrow actually is one of these straight segments. So I don't think we're gonna find any channel sinuosity there. So, when you're looking at this parameter, you, you're trying to imagine how much longer would the stream be if it was straightened out. So here's an example of some of the different ways that you can characterize sinuosity. And so using those, uh, the, the graphic is kind of opposite of the optimal to poor scale there. So Optimal would be the graphic on the right, highly meandering, where straight would be a graphic on the left, which would be the, the poor end of the scale. So ultimately, again, for scoring, you're going to add up all your scores. I only covered the four categories that are different than Rocky Bottom. So several of the categories are the same. So again, you're going to have 10 categories. You can have 20 points each, add those up, divide by two, come up with your index score. And then you'll compare that to your reference and give it a score. So now I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about some other types of habitat measurements that are done by King County in conjunction with the BIBI, the Benthic Index of Biotic Integrity uh, sampling that is done uh, annually on different creeks. And the reason why these are done is that these particular factors are highly correlated with BIBI scores. So the piece of equipment, one of the pieces of equipment that they use for measuring tree canopy coverage is called a densiometer. And so it's a little device. It looks sort of like a compass. It has a convex um, mirror on it. And for our purposes, you'll see another picture of it. We cover up some of those uh, intersecting points in the graph or in the, on the, the mirror uh, with tape so that we're only looking, we only leave 17 of them and essentially like one quarter of it exposed. So 
in terms of what we're talking about, just the concept of canopy cover, it's the amount of shade that's over the stream. And so that can affect the temperature of the water. It can affect the beginning of the food chain in terms of what leaf litter and woody debris falls in, which can also affect habitat. It can also affect bank stability. And it's a little bit of a technical description there, but essentially one way that you can measure it is with a method using this densiometer. So that's an example of densiometer. And you can see how part of it has been taped so that there's just essentially like a, a quarter section uh, that's remaining of the grid. So to use it, the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna take three sets of samples. So you're gonna be uh, like, if this were, let's say we were doing this in uh, riffles that we're monitoring for BIBI, we would be doing a downstream riffle, a middle and an upstream riffle. Um, but in this case for our, if we wanted to integrate this with our other habitat assessment, we would essentially do a downstream section, a middle section and an upstream section of our reach. So what you do is you stand in the st uh, stream and face upstream and you hold it a fixed distance above the water. Um, you can just barely see it in that drawing, but there's actually a little string hanging down. It's kind of looped around the hinge and you can see it down below, but essentially that's something that can help you uh, hold it at a fixed point. And then you're gonna look in it so you can just barely see your own face in the bottom of that V and use, there's a little bubble level on it to level it out. And when you're doing that, you're then gonna look at that mirror that's not covered and count up how many of those little intersections are covered by some sort of tree cover or not. There's a total of 17, so the, if it was completely covered, your number would be 17. And if you had no vegetation, then your number would be zero. So then you've done that facing upstream. Now you're gonna do right bank, left bank, and downstream. And so you've done it four times at three different sections. And that's going to give you 12 different numbers that you've collected. So again, if uh, you have no coverage, it would be close to zero. If it's totally shaded, you'd be close to 17. And when you come up with your result, you don't need to do anything with it mathematically. You just record what you find. So uh, again, I would put this in your, if you're going to do this integrated with a, a PCD method where you have a site sketch, or even if you're not, I think it would be, if you're gonna use this from year to year to compare canopy cover, you should write down on your site map where you've done these assessments. But essentially you've just characterized what your coverage is facing each direction, downstream, middle and upstream. So that's the tree canopy assessment. The second assessment that is done is a stream sediment assessment and so uh, there's a technique called the Woolman pebble count. And I don't know who Woolman was, but they came up with a pebble count and use this piece of equipment here called a gravelometer. And what this is, is it's a, something that you uh, put different stones that you find in the creek through and you write down uh, the letter make a tally of the letter for each one that you find. So there's a, essentially a methodical way that you collect systematically and somewhat randomly selects uh, pebbles um, and then sort them into cat classes. So you'll have one person who's in the stream who has that uh, gravelometer and they're collecting and gathering and collecting pebbles and putting them through that gravelometer and giving you a letter. So if you look at each of these, like the very tiny one has a letter A, the next one has a letter B, 
and so on up to letter N. And so on the chart here, we've got those letters correspond to different sizes of pebbles that you would collect. So the way that you pick the pebbles is you start standing at the water's edge at one of the riffles. And you're either gonna make an actual transect with a string or rope, or you're just gonna have an imaginary transect perpendicular to the stream. And so in our case, let's say that we were doing this in conjunction with our flow monitoring, we could use our upstream and our downstream transects that we'd already established. And then we could either establish a middle transect or just have an imaginary transect, but we're gonna have three different sections where we're gonna, or potentially three different sections where we're gonna do this. You don't necessarily have to have three sections if you come up with a hundred pebbles before that. So you're gonna come up with a way to uh, determine how are you gonna collect those pebbles? How are you gonna randomly but systematically collect those pebbles? So one method that one of our key volunteers, uh, Leora uh, uses with her King County work is you put your foot on the edge of the water and you collect the first pebble that you randomly touch on the side of your foot without looking. And then you just continue to advance along and collect a pebble at a time that way, just by what your foot happens to come into touch with or what you, what you happen to grab that's touching your foot randomly, um, working your way across the transect. So then you're gonna take that pebble that you picked up, you're gonna put it through that gravelometer and put it through the tightest opening that it'll fit through and you'll call out a letter and the person who's working with you would record that. If it's too big to fit through any of the openings, there is a ruler section on it and you can use that to record uh, the rock size that you found. And you're gonna record the uh, intermediate axis. So in that diagram, you can see there's kind of a long axis and there's sort of the, what we call the intermediate axis, which is like the shorter axis. And that's what you're gonna record. So you're gonna continue along your transect, collecting those pebbles and doing the pebble count until you get to the other side. And then if you haven't hit hundred pebbles yet, then you're gonna select a new transect and keep going until you have at least 100 pebbles. Now, if you get 100 and you're only halfway across, finish and collect more pebbles before you stop. Then later what you'll do, and I'll show you essentially the way that the data is tallied. Um, you can, it says it can later be plotted, but essentially the process of collecting this data gives you a graphical representation of the sediment. So here's an example of the completed data sheet that was used for um, BIBI sampling on Little Swamp Creek. So um, the densiometer results are kind of in the middle there. And you can see that they're mostly 15, 16, 17, pretty high numbers. Um, that's really mainly because when we moved in here, a few years after we moved in here, we had the Adopt a Stream Foundation come and do a repairing and restoration project and just plant tons of native plants and trees where we used to have lawn right up to the creek. So now our coverage is pretty good with the densiometer. So you can see the densiometer results there. And then you can kind of see for our creek how the tally goes for pebbles. So that's kind of our distribution of pebbles. So some sand, some fine gravel, um, mostly kind of a medium and coarse gravel and really not much bigger than that. And that's the process. So again, these are the references that I used for putting this together. Streamkeepers Field Guide, um, Department of Ecology Guide for Using a Densiometer, King County's Benthic Macroinvertebrate Sampling Guide, and we get support from King County Wastewater Treatment Division Waterworks Grant Program. So thank you, and I will uh, stop recording now and take any additional questions.
How long will we be on the water tomorrow? 